use it. It's nice to see images of participants. Please mute yourself while others are speaking. Unmute to speak. When you want to contribute, please speak up. Participants can also use the chat feature if you'd like to comment or ask a question. Type in your questions on chat for the group to consider and I'll read them. We will have a designated uh, Q&A time at the end of uh, this, this presentation. Uh, again, don't forget to mute again after speaking. So today's session is being recorded and the recording will be made available by request at that email address, which is mine. This year's focus is on religious spiritual struggles and we have three excellent presenters uh, lined up. Um, and as you can see there, these are a home run hitting uh, team. And we invite you to not just attend today's session, but uh, the following sessions with Dr. George Fichette and Dr. Elizabeth Pierre as well. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Kenneth Argument. He is an ideal presenter of this topic uh, because Dr. Pargament has been a seminal figure in spiritually integrated care. I, I think for those who have been involved in spiritually integrated care longer than I have, uh, would recall that questions about spirituality was highly contested uh, decades ago, specifically in the 80s and 90s. There's a couple of people who stand out who were essential in changing that story. Uh, Dr. Pargman is one of those important figures that changed the narrative. He created an enormous uh, empirical base on religious coping, religious health, highlighting that this is part of many people's lives and their stories. Dr. Pargman has over 300 publications. He's the editor chief of the 2013 two volume APA handbook of psychology, religion and spirituality. And with Dr. Julie Exline has recently authored work, working with spiritual struggles and psychotherapy from research to practice. Um, his works, not, not, not just at a personal level, but I think in the field, in multidisciplinary fields, his works are classic texts to read and are widely read by many multidisciplinary multidisciplinary clinicians. I'm very grateful to have you share with us today, Dr. Pargament. The time is yours. Thank you very much, Edward, and thank you for your very, very kind words. Um, let me uh, do my screen sharing and then we can get started here. Okay. Um, to move this if I can, so I can get to the, well, uh, let's see here. I can move this up. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll try to, uh, I'm trying to get to the uh, start, uh, start show button here, but for some reason I'm unable to, uh, move it aside from this. Um, I think at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At that one icon, the beginning to the right, that would Which be the fourth slide. Go to the right. Okay. Right. Uh, next one. There. Right there. Ah, very good. Okay. Thank you, Edward. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be able to spend some time with you. Uh, this afternoon. Um, and I should start by thanking the John Templeton Foundation for their support of much of the research cited in this presentation. And my uh, wonderful colleague, Julie Exline from Case Western University, who uh, has shared my interest and in work in this area for a number of years. And it's just been a real honor to be able to work together with her over the years. Um, and uh, if, if you find this, if you'd like to take a deeper dive into this area, um, the, the research and practice that's ongoing now, um, we did, as Edward mentioned, we've just published a book, Working with Spiritual Struggles in Psychotherapy, 
from research to practice, you can always uh, take a look at that. As I promise that's my only plug <laughs> today. Um, I recognize that that you, as, as chaplains and spiritual care professionals, are the real experts on this topic. Uh, much of what I'm going to be sharing with you is, is nothing new. Um, and I'm very grateful to you for all of your work and what you've taught me, because a lot of the uh, a lot of the ideas and insights that are in this this work come from my uh, collaborations and interactions with chaplains over the years. So thank you. Um, what I think um, I may be able to add here is a, a an accumulating and substantive body of research that underscores the power of spiritual struggles for health and well-being and i would say also underscores the vital role that you play in your work and um and the, i think um, distinctive role that you serve in healthcare and in other contexts more generally so let me just preface this talk and i mean we're talking here about a problematic side of spirituality um, but I want you to be clear that I want to be clear that uh, religion and spirituality are, for most people, most of the time, really important positive resources that they turn to in difficult times. Um, here's an example. This is a this figure describes across 40 countries, so huge numbers of people contributing to this figure. The numbers of Google searches for the term prayer, the month before COVID became recognized as a major problem in the world. And then the, that, that month, mid-March to the beginning of April, and you can see the dramatic rise in searches for the term prayer on Google uh, over this time period, which underscores the, the well-established fact that in difficult times, when we're put to our greatest tests, when we feel most out of control, people, turn to their faith for guidance, support, solace, and direction. And for many people, as they turn to their religious coping resources, they find that these are among the most powerful and helpful. Uh, just cite one study. This was a meta-analysis of 103 studies that looked at uh, what predicts stress-related growth growth following major life traumas and events. And what this study found was in looking at all of the possible predictors in this research literature, including optimism, social support, general measures of spirituality, secular coping, positive religious coping emerged as the strongest predictor of stress-related growth across these 103 studies. I think it highlights the um, success of spirituality in helping people come to terms with their deepest uh, challenges in life and find uh, meaning, purpose, and significance. Uh, and, and religion and spirituality are themselves generally quite resilient to these most difficult times. People hold on to their faith generally in times of stress. Having said that, though, there are, uh, there are times when when, our, uh, when, we encounter, when we encounter internal or external stressors that shake people to their core, um, they call into question our understanding of what's sacred, and the ground that we stand on is no longer stable or steady. And these are times of spiritual struggles. Let me give you an example. Um, I've, uh, I'm an academic clinical psychologist, and over the years, I've kept my hands in clinical work uh, one day a week. Um, so let me share a story that was quite influential in my own development and interest in this topic. And it's a story of one of my clinical cases. Um, I'll call him George. George was an African-American male. At the time I saw him, he was in his late 50s. Um, when I met him in the waiting room, um, he was sitting there kind of like this man looks. Uh, this isn't really George, um, but bent over, haggard, uh, staring into the distance. 
Um, before I could even take him back into my office, he started repeating, my brother Joe is dead. My brother Joe is dead. Um, and he just kept repeating that almost like a mantra. I asked George to come back with me to the office and so we could talk about his brother. And he followed me and for the first few minutes, that's all he could say, my brother Joe is dead. I asked him to tell me a little bit about his brother and he did. And he went on to describe just a, a real um, encounter with suffering in his life. Over the last five years, he had lost both of his parents to, to cancer and heart disease. He had lost both of his adult sons to neurodegenerative disease. And he'd lost his brother, Joe. George had been the caretaker to all of his relatives. And so he, he was with them as they experienced these you know, terrible deaths. Uh, these weren't George's first experiences of, of, of loss. He was a Vietnam combat veteran. And he relayed the story of being on patrol with his unit and they took a break, drew straws to see who would get the water for the unit. He lost, so he goes to a nearby stream. And while he's there, the unit is mortared and they were all killed. George was the only survivor. In spite of these trials for much of his life, George had been sustained by his, uh, by his faith. He was a member, a deacon in the AME church. Um, his father was a preacher as was his brother, Joe. They all had been caring fathers, strong members of their church. And George had taken a lot of pride in the fact that his adult sons had never gotten into drugs or crime um, and had held jobs and been responsible parents themselves. I asked George what was the most painful part of these, this litany of experiences. And he answered with one word, why? Why he asked was God putting him through this hell why had God singled him out for this misery? He saw other men in the community, the same age as his sons, who were involved in drugs and crime and gangs, and they were healthy and alive. Why hadn't God taken them, George asked. Uh, his brother Joe was the best man George had known, a man who touched everyone with love. Why had God taken Joe? Who was this God, he asked. How could he ever pray to this kind of God again? And if it was God, if this was who God was, George said, this was no God he could ever love. If this is who God was, he hated him. Now, George had been traumatized virtually every way, psychologically, socially, and physically. But I want to point out that what he perceived as his greatest trauma was spiritual. George's conflicts were not only with God. Um, when he sought out his minister for some counseling, um, his minister said he needed to do some soul searching and see where he had stepped out of God's good graces. And George was very bittered by that, embittered, um, and, and said, and he calls himself a man of God. And his friends were no more helpful than that. When he talked about his losses, they would bring up how well their own children were doing. So how did I make sense of George? Well, clearly he was met all the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but in addition to that, he was struggling spiritually. And oftentimes in our work uh, in, in the mental health field, we overlook the spiritual dimension of people's trauma. But there are times when it's the religious conflict and tension and strain that's the most significant issue of all. And I think this was certainly the case with George. In, in this brief talk, I'd like to suggest a few things. That spiritual struggles are a natural part of life. They're not pathological. So I don't want us to add another diagnostic category the spiritual struggle, but they have profound implications for health and well being. And in some ways, we can think of them as a fork in the road. 
they can lead to decline, but they can also lead to growth. And sometimes they lead to a little bit of both. And I'm going to conclude by saying spiritual struggles are a vital topic for healthcare. So let me offer a definition of spiritual struggles. They refer to experiences of tension, strain, and conflict about sacred matters with the supernatural, within oneself, and with others. So they cover a broad domain. Supernatural struggles. Certainly, George was experiencing struggles with God. We can find examples in the uh, Hebrew Bible, in the New Testament, in Psalms, Jesus on the cross. A more current example came from one of my undergraduate students who emailed me this after I was giving a talk on struggles to my undergraduate psych of religion class. She wrote, I'm suffering, really suffering. My illness, she has bipolar illness, is tearing me down and I'm angry at God for not rescuing me. I mean, really setting me free from my mental bondage. I've been dealing with these issues for 10 years now and I'm only 24. I don't understand why he keeps lifting me up just to let me come crashing down again. There are other types of supernatural struggles. Oh, here's, here, here are a couple of examples of items from our measure of struggles that Julie Xline um, directed. Felt as though God had let me down, felt angry at God, felt punished by God, felt abandoned by God. And there are also demonic struggles, feeling tension, strain, and conflict with evil forces, evil spirits, or a demonic figure, feeling tormented by the devil or evil spirits, attacked by the devil or evil spirits, and so on. We then have intrapersonal struggles that are struggles within oneself, and they can involve tensions between one's sense of higher values and purpose and one's uh, needs and desires, kind of like an id superego conflict in Freudian terms. And we can find examples again in scripture. Uh, in Romans, Paul says, I do not what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. That, that speaks to that kind of moral tension and conflict internally. Another example, it comes from a book that a uh, Norwegian chaplain, dear friend of mine, Tor Jorbenson, shared with me. Uh, it's called The Diary of Peter Moen. Peter Moen was a, a journalist who was captured by the Gestapo in Oslo in Norway during World War II. He was jailed and tortured to give up the names of his fellow uh, resistance fighters in Norway. And under torture, he eventually gave in and gave up the names of his colleagues and friends. And as a result, he was wrecked by torture. He kept a diary in his jail cell. Uh, he had a thumbtack and he used toilet paper, which was very rough and coarse. And he was able to use the thumbtack to write on the, or punch holes to indicate words on the toilet paper. And he, he could keep all of the papers, all the pages beneath the grate in the jail cell to hide it. Well, he was um, eventually uh, sent by boat to be, be um, uh, imprisoned in a concentration camp in Germany. And, and when he was on the boat, um, he, was, he talked to a colleague of his and he told his colleague that he had written this diary and where he had hidden it. The boat was then uh, bombed and it sunk and Peter Moen died. But his colleague survived and was also interned in a concentration camp, but he survived. And after the war, he went back to the jail cell in Oslo and was able to recover the diary and then had it published. And the diary is just this incredibly powerful account of moral struggle, of the tension he's feeling between um, his higher values and principles and what he had done, his actual actions. And in, at one point he writes, I must recognize with bitter and painful regret 
how inexpressibly badly I've lived. I've reduced to dust all moral and material values. Here's an example of moral struggle items, um, wrestling with attempts to follow one's moral principles, uh, feeling torn between what one wants and what one knows is morally right, guilt for not living up to moral standards. Another intrapersonal struggle involves struggles of ultimate meaning, questioning whether life really matters, um, concerns about whether there's any ultimate purpose to life or existence. And then there are religious doubt struggles, questions about the truths of religious uh, claims. And um, here you see some examples, feeling confused about religious or spiritual beliefs, being troubled by doubts or questions about religion or spirituality and so on. And the third class of struggles are interpersonal, struggles between people around spiritual sacred matters feeling hurt, mistreated, or offended by religious people, uh, conflicts with other people about religion and spirituality, anger at organized religion. Certainly, um, much of George's PTSD and depression was tied to the bitterness um, he felt and sense of abandonment and betrayal by his clergy and his religious community. So with that brief review of kinds of spiritual struggle, let me just make some basic points, what we're learning from our research and, and work in the area. First of all, they're not a sign of weak faith. Um, Mother Teresa, um, as, as I'm sure you're aware, in spite of the wonderful work that she did, was also grappling with feelings of alienation and abandonment by God, feeling a sense of spiritual dryness or emptiness in her life at times that were very, very painful for her. She struggled, in spite of, but she had a, a, a very powerful faith as well. Spiritual struggles are not uncommon. Here are some famous strugglers. Um, St. Augustine, Galileo, Charles Darwin, uh, uh, Dostoevsky, oh, wait, that may not be Dostoevsky, oh, that's Tolstoy, and uh, George Harrison all struggled. And uh, I mean, these are all white bearded males, but people, other people struggle as well from all demographic groups. Just some statistics here. In, in a survey of over 17,000 Americans, 70% report struggles at some point in their lives. One third to one half report struggles in the last few weeks. And they they're, um, can be found among all, every religious group, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and atheists. Atheists, for instance, commonly struggle uh, interpersonally with, with religious and spiritual issues with other people. They also face moral struggles and ultimate meaning struggles. Um, struggles are can be found in virtually every demographic group. So I think we're talking about a pretty universal phenomena here. I don't have time. Oh, and uh, another study by uh, Winkleman and the Balbonis at Harvard of advanced cancer patients. And they found that 58% were experiencing spiritual struggle at this end of life phase. 30% um, wondered why God was allowing it to happen. About 30% felt abandoned by God, 25% 25 25 ang angry at God, 22% uh, felt God cancer was a punishment from God. Not a majority, but certainly a significant minority of people struggling with profound uh, questions about God's role in their illness and place in their lives. Spiritual struggles grow out of personal, social, and situational factors. I don't have time to elaborate much on that other than to note that there, there certainly can be found around the tensions and conflicts we're experiencing um, politically now with COVID, uh, with climate change, with migration issues. Struggles are wrapped up in each of these uh, important uh, 
external factors, contextual factors. And struggles are natural, but they're often painful and distressing. Here's an example of the way one uh, sister in the Roman Catholic Church described her struggle with the church. <clears throat> and if you're interested in this, this is a book by Joan Chittister uh, entitled Scarred by Struggle, Transformed by Hope. It's a really great book. Here's how she describes her struggle. struggle. She finds herself swimming in a sea of black. Frustration sweeps over her like waves on a beach, upending her in deep water. And day after day, the struggle rages. Struggle is never done without cost, she concludes. Real struggle marks us for life. So struggles, as this, as this quote illustrates, are not trivial or minor. They touch people deeply. They shake us to our core. We've done some, uh, actually a number of studies have been done now that show robust links between spiritual struggle and poor health and well-being. In one study uh, that I, I did with my wonderful colleague, Hisham Abu Raya, uh, in a national sample of Americans, all types of struggle that I just listed were tied to greater depression, greater anxiety, less life satisfaction, and less happiness. Another study, again, by my uh, wonderful colleague, Joe Courier, of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the vets completed a comprehensive measure of suicidality. And Joe found that higher levels of spiritual struggle were strongly tied to suicidality, uh, and in particular, the likelihood of future attempts. Interesting, with all the variables he had in the study, Spiritual struggles were the only significant predictor of suicidality. These are just a, a few examples. I want to cite one more. There, there are, again, literally hundreds of studies now on this topic that show pretty much the same thing. One of the early studies I conducted with Harold Koenig at Duke University, where we studied 600 hospitalized patients over 55 and followed them up over two years, during which time, oh, about, uh, about a fourth or so died. And what we found was that struggles with God were predictive of increases in depression, declines in physical functional status, declines in quality of life. And the most, I think, uh, striking finding was that struggles with God increased the risk of dying over those two years. After, after controls were entered in. You know, we're, we're aware that um, involvement in religious- oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I'm sorry, somebody has their, uh, their uh, line open. So if you could uh, turn that off, that would be great. Um, we know that uh, the frequency of congregational attendance is generally tied to improved longevity, people who attend uh, their congregations, white Americans uh, have a seven-year life expectancy advantage. African Americans, it's a 14-year life expectancy advantage by attending frequently. Um, this is the first study that's really shown that certain forms of spirituality can be risk factors for mortality. In particular, we found that feeling abandoned by God, uh, questioning God's love for one, and feeling that the illness is responsible, that the devil is responsible for the illness, these predicted greater likelihood of dying over the following two years. Um, I should add that the, the research we're talking about here has now been conducted across uh, religious groups, um, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist. It's been done across countries now in Europe, uh, the Mideast, uh, South America, the findings seems to be very consistent across these contexts. They apply to atheists as well. Uh, we know that interpersonal spiritual struggles and moral struggles among atheists are predictive of depression and anxiety for them. 
So it's a topic that's relevant to, again, virtually everyone. One more study I want to mention to you really quickly here, because I think it's really important. We were interested in whether or not spiritual struggles might help explain why stressful life events or traumas lead to poor adjustment. Uh, we know that life trauma can, can really re result in declines in mental health and physical health, but not everyone exposed to trauma has these negative outcomes. And we wondered whether the important factor that may account for that link may be struggles. Maybe what's important is whether the trauma triggers a spiritual struggle. And the spiritual struggle then may have the more immediate implications for adjustment. And we conducted the study again with a national sample, Julie Pomerleau, and we found that was the case that religious and spiritual struggles mediated the relationship between life stressors that people experienced and their subsequent adjustment. So what this says is how important it is to be uh, uh, sensitive to and uh, aware of the, the ways that stressful life events may work through spiritual struggles. So if you're encountering people who are traumatized or going through major problems in life, as you are, you want to know about their struggles because struggles may have the more immediate implications for their health and well-being. Okay, so it seems clear that struggles have important implications for, for uh, health and well-being and negative implications, really. But is this the full story? In, in psychological practice, uh, we often tell our clients and patients that their, their problems can be a source of positive change, that through their pain, they may experience growth and transformation. Could that be true of spiritual struggles? Well, we certainly find examples of that in the world's religious traditions. Um, Moses, Job, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, all of them are described as experiencing periods of struggle in their lives. I, I might even go so far as to say that's part of the classic uh, storyline of the major religious traditions, the religious figures experiencing a struggle and coming through it transformed. Um, Buddha, for instance, as we see in this, this uh, rendition, is tempted by the, the demon Mara by, with his three daughters who represent um, lust, pride, and fear. And Buddha's ability to um, withstand these temptations, a classic moral struggle, is what led to his enlightenment and when his transformation from uh, Siddhartha Gautama to the Buddha. Um, much of the work in psychology rests on the idea that people um, can indeed turn their pain and problems into growth and transformation. Um, theorists from Jean Piaget to Eric Erickson, and I, and I should add James Fowler's work in faith development, all talk about stress and strain as precursors to growth and maturation. And certainly there's no shortage of current narratives that illustrate this. Um, Joan Chittister describes the benefits of her struggle. She says, Struggle gives life depth and vision, insight and understanding. It not only transforms us, and makes us transforming as well. Okay, at the, at the very least, um, oh, but, but what's, I'm gonna have to skip this. At the, the what's, what's more puzzling is when we do empirical research to see if struggles in fact are tied to reports of growth, the findings are not clear at all. There's no consistent link. Some people seem to grow through struggles, some decline as a result of their struggles, and some show no change as a result of their struggles. So at the very least, this suggests we've got to be careful about sentimentalizing spiritual struggles. Pain doesn't always lead to gain. It's not inevitable. Instead, we think it might be helpful to think of struggles as a fork in the road. 
They can lead to growth, but they can lead to decline or sometimes both. The key question then is what determines the trajectory of struggles? And this question has important practical implications because we wanna help people move down the road towards growth rather than decline. Let me just suggest a few of these um, factors that shape the trajectory of struggles. This is all relatively recent work. Acceptance. Can you accept the struggle or do you try to suppress it? A study by um, Carmen Omig found that people who try to avoid or suppress their struggle experience greater anxiety as their struggles increased as opposed to people who are accepting of their struggle, who didn't experience greater anxiety with more struggles. This brings to mind what psychiatrist R.D. Lang once wrote. I love this quote. There's a great deal of pain in life and perhaps the only pain in life that can be avoided is the pain that comes from trying to avoid pain. I really like that. Finding support for the struggle is another important factor. A study by Julie Exline looked at adults who shared their anger toward God with others. About half of them experienced supportive responses, but about half received unsupportive responses, judgmental responses, shaming responses. And supportive responses were tied to more um, closeness with God and stronger faith, but unsupportive responses were tied to suppression, anger, turning away from God, and greater substance use. So whether or not people can find support in the midst of the struggles is an important factor that determines their trajectory. Finding hope in the midst of the time of struggles. I know in, in my own clinical work, I've, I've found it really useful to share a hopeful metaphor that, that comes from uh, Kintsugi art. Kintsugi is a form of art, uh, Japanese art, uh, that's based on the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi, which says that, that in imperfection, we can find beauty. And in Kintsugi, you work with a, a ceramic a whole ceramic, and then you shatter it. You then rebuild the ceramic, put the pieces together with gold or silver filigree. And here are some Kintsugi finished works of art. And you can see that the piece has been shattered and re-put together, but it's beautiful. And the idea here is that we can create wholeness through brokenness, that we can create works of art through brokenness. And among people that I work with who often come in feeling broken, it's a very hopeful metaphor that they can uh, think of their lives as a work of art and progress, and they can create their own kintsugi. Um, I had one of my former clients send me a thank you note and uh, addressed it to Ken Sugi, which I took as really high praise. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, just in the interest of time. I want to make sure we have time to uh, talk about some, talk about questions and comments. So let me skip to the practical side. And again, I'm speaking to the choir here, and I often share this type of practical information with mental health professionals who are really at a loss around spiritual struggles. And I, what not to do, I start with, don't change the subject. Um, you don't need a PhD in theology to be able to listen to someone's struggles. And it's not rocket science to be able to apply basic clinical skills to spiritual strugglers. Um, and that's an important part of, of what, the, what sound clinical work involves. Don't assume you understand. Um, the most important thing we can do is oftentimes to say, uh, can you tell me more? I'm interested. Don't judge, don't criticize. Don't offer easy answers um, or try to solve the problem with, easy, with, with um, 
quick and easy fixes. These struggles reflect powerful existential conflicts and easy answers won't do the trick. As a matter of fact, they may make matters worse. So what can we do? And again, I know you're doing these, many of these things. Ask about spiritual struggles. Ask about how uh, a patient or client's problems have affected them religiously or spiritually. That opens the door to spiritual struggles. There are screeners available now for spiritual struggles. Uh, George Fitchett and Stephen King have, have developed some spiritual struggles in working with large groups of patients to try to identify strugglers as they come in early in the uh, hospitalization process. Julie Exelan and I are also working on screeners. We have a, a brief 14 item form of our struggles measure that can be used as well. Listen to and normalize spiritual struggles. I think in my work with George, the most valuable thing I did was to just be present and listen to him as he talked about his, his pain. He wasn't able to share that with his pastor, with his church, but he could talk about it with me. And I think in that way, it was a gift when we're able to do that for people in terrible pain, just simply be present. That in itself is a gift. Uh, I should just mention that George Zorno, a Lutheran pastor in, in, in Ohio, has developed this program called Crying Out to God based on the Book of Lamentations. And he goes out to churches and he um, encourages church members to lament, to share their, their feelings towards God. He says, God is big enough to accept all of your feelings and wants to hear them. So in his group meeting, he has church members write their lamentations on a, on a, uh, a, uh, 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 a white board up front in the whole group. But what's really, I think, important is George Zorno, Lutheran pastor, goes first. He shares his lamentations. And I think in that way normalizes it and serves as a role model that even pastors, even chaplains, even um, the, the deepest religious figures have times of struggle. This kind of work, spiritual struggles, really calls for a multidisciplinary collaboration. And this is a, a message I stress with mental health professionals, that they should be working with you. They should be working in collaboration with you to offer the most um, holistic type of service to their clients. Um, and in doing so, I think it everyone learns through this collaborative process. I found um, I have a group of, of pastors and chaplains I work with over the years, and I think everybody gains through this process. I certainly have been inspired and taught by my, uh, my friends and colleagues in the ministry and in chaplaincy. And I think everybody, again, uh, has something to learn. We all have something to learn from each other. Develop and evaluate creative programs to address struggles. We, there's a lot of room for being innovative here. Let me just share one example that was developed in my, my uh, graduate seminar, which I really think is a neat program. We developed a program called Winding Road for college students dealing with spiritual struggles. And college students coming to college for the first time, leaving family behind, often struggle with moral issues, with interpersonal issues, with questions of ultimate meaning, and we wanted them to have a place to go. We wanted them to be able to share their struggle, normalize the struggles, broaden their coping resources, uh, facilitate acceptance of struggle as a natural, normal part of life. And our, our team of wonderful grad students uh, had came up with these really creative activities as part of this eight-week group. One was to have students write and share a spiritual autobiography. Another was to talk openly about their spiritual struggles. Students learned they're not alone. One, I think, really imaginative experience was to have students imagine themselves as older spiritual sages, 90-year-olds who've attained the age of spiritual wisdom 
and they offered spiritual advice to the younger version of themselves. And it was really wonderful advice. <laughs> students shared a sacred object with the group. One student shared an amulet she always wore that contained uh, a bit of the ashes of her father who had died when she was a young adolescent. And we did the group Lament to God, uh, a la George Zorno. Um, we found the, the program was very helpful. Uh, these statistics just show that students declined in their struggles, experienced relief from psychological distress, and a number of, of benefits. We interviewed the students, and uh, they have really nice things to say about the program. One student uh, captures the acceptance she felt through the program. I'm okay with the fact that I have struggles now. It's okay for me to be struggling with this. It's okay to not have the answers right now. It's a little scary, but it's okay. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be confused. It's okay just to take my time and try to figure it out and not let anybody else pressure me about things. I think this is a wonderful kind of uh, transformation for a student when it comes to spiritual struggles. Yeah, Pamela, yeah, I mean, it sounds like. Uh... Okay, I'm getting some uh, other comments from people right now. So, could, if you could turn your your voice off, that would be great. Um, uh, let, let me conclude that I think that uh, struggles take time to work with, and I know you may not have that luxury of time in your work. Uh, with George, um, he I worked with him for a year, and by the end of the year. Uh, he hadn't finished struggling, but when I asked him where he stood with his struggles, he said, well, God and me, we've declared a truce. He's gone to his side of the ring and I've gone to my side of the ring. So I suspect George has more wrestling to do, but he was in a different place now. He was back involved with his church teaching Sunday school. And the struggle was something he was able to accept more as part of his life. And he was able to move forward in his life. And again, I think of everything I did with him, my silence and willingness to listen and understand without judgment was the most helpful thing that I did for him. So let me just briefly conclude here. Um, struggles are a natural part of life. They can be a source of great distress, but they can also be a source of growth and transformation. And we as health professionals and chaplains can help clients and patients respond to struggles in ways that help them at this pivotal point in life, this fork in the road, and to help them move towards greater wholeness and growth. So um, that's a brief uh, little story of spiritual struggles. And at this point, I think we can open it up for, for questions. Thank you, Dr. Pargament. Um, thank you for the thorough presentation. It's impressive. Uh, what you reviewed in 45 minutes. And so <laughs> uh, I want to open this time to questions, comments, reflections, including takeaways. You can share those in chat or unmute yourselves. And Dr. Pergman, I have a question. Do you think that we will find with spiritual struggle, the same thing that we found with comorbid addiction problems and serious mental illness, that integrated treatment works better than either sequential or parallel treatment? And if so, what would an integrated training program look like? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that great question. Um, you know, it, it, if we assume we're biopsychosocial spiritual people, as I do, then the notion of somehow separating out the different aspects of who we are is, is like um, somewhat absurd uh, because it's all, it's the way we come. We're, we're kind of <laughs> packaged that way. And we can't separate, it's, it's like trying to pull out the threads of a sweater uh, of just one color. You can't do it. Um, for instance, when I assess for spiritual struggles, I assess it as part of my general assessment. I ask, for instance, a depressed client, um, tell me how your, your depression has affected you uh, emotionally. How's it affecting you socially? How's it affecting you physically? And then I say, 
How's it affecting you spiritually? It's not disconnected. It's not like, okay, let's talk about the spiritual side. No, it's all woven together. And I think that's why I, I wrote a book called Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy. It's because spirituality is an integral part of our lives. It's an integral part of problems. It's also an integral part of solutions. And we need to know how to do this weaving. That's where I think a lot of our, our wisdom and experience comes in weaving together these facets of, our, of, of who we are as whole human beings. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Stan. Anyone else? Edward, this is Josh. I have a question. Yes. Um, thanks so much for your presentation. I'm a palliative care physician here at Northwestern. Um, I'm wondering about when we face patients or families or perhaps even colleagues who are skeptical about these topics. Gosh, I'm not convinced, Dr. Pargament, they might say, that this is important. Yeah. Well, I spent 40 years trying to talk to skeptical people. <laughs> and uh, actually, I enjoy talking to skeptical people because if they're skeptical, then there's a possibility of being persuaded. Um, if there are, you know, there are people who are already persuaded and there are people who aren't skeptical, they're convinced that this just has no place or value in uh, healthcare. And those folks, I, I don't think, will, will be responsive to any argument. What I've tried to do in this work, and what I think people in the, the scientific study of religion and spirituality generally do, is they try to marshal evidence-based uh, rationale for why it's important to attend to this aspect of, of uh, health and well-being and um, let the data speak for themselves. I think overall, that's the reason why um, we've had so much success over the last 20, 30 years. We have like uh, Harold Koenig's handbook of religion, uh, of religion uh, and health. We have hundreds of studies now uh, consistently documenting important links between health and well-being, including longevity and uh, immune system functioning. So uh, addictions and all of that. So again, I think with skeptical, uh, in a skeptical audience, if you present the data, then we're often, I think, successful in persuading at least some that this is something to take seriously. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. Um, we have a question on um, chat. What brought you to this work and what keeps you going? Oh, well, thank you for that. If I had longer, I usually start with that. But, um, you know, I went into psychology because I thought psychology dealt with the big questions that I was struggling with. You know, why are we here in this world? How do you make the world a better place? Those kinds of basic um, questions. And uh, when I went to grad school, it was pretty, it was a time of a uh, uh, heavily influenced by behaviorism. I only semi-jokingly say that my first client was a five pound pigeon where we did uh, uh, studies on how to understand uh, reinforcement schedules with the pigeons. And that was okay. I mean, certainly uh, learning theory can be helpful with some people, but my pigeon didn't have any answers to the big questions that had drawn me to the field. And uh, I started reading about religion, not so much because I was attracted to uh, theology as much as I, I felt like there were kindred spirits who were writing. They were also interested in the big questions. And I, I started going out to a variety of religious settings, churches, synagogues, mosques, and so on, and talking to people about the role of faith in their lives and found it to be very moving and very powerful. And it was, for me, trying to explore my own uh, my own being Jewish, conservative Jewish, I, I didn't really know why that was so important to me. So I ended up involved in this for both personal and uh, professional re reasons. And I got hooked early in my life and I'm, I'm still hooked. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Evan, for sharing that, that question with us. Anyone else? Are you going to repeat the workshop that you did with uh, uh, the folks at um, 
in Denver at Iliff School of Theology, that 30 hour workshop? Yeah, uh, I don't think anything that long, but if you're interested, APA this year, American Psychological Association, Julie Eckstein are doing a workshop, a half day workshop on spiritual struggles in Minneapolis. Um, and uh, you know, if, you know others who might be interested in, a, in our doing a workshop where we're really trying to uh, get the word out, so sure. We've been doing a lot of one hour talks, but it's, it's kind of, as you can tell, it's kind of trying to pack a lot of information and it's the kind of the whirlwind tour through spiritual struggles. And I have a question and it's regarding you as a researcher and you've shared quite a bit of the links to the work on screening. Uh, as you think of the future moving forward, you have 40 years of history of this type of work where do you see priorities and research focusing with this work? Yeah, I think the uh, some of the most exciting work will be in developing um, programs um, to help people who are spiritually struggling. Um, programs that can be offered uh, through online, educational programs, um, group programs. There's uh, all kinds of possibilities for helping people struggle who are dealing with struggles i didn't i didn't show one slide of your your question edward it allows me to to just briefly mention i think some of the exciting work too will be on helping people anticipate struggles before they emerge um, adolescence for instance we know that's a time of spiritual struggle um, but in part i think it's because adolescents have no place to go with their struggles they're not generally talked about in religious education um, they're not generally talked around the family dinner table, but why not? Why shouldn't these be part of, uh, say, uh, part of a sermon on, on the pulpit? Why wouldn't the minister or pastor or rabbi or imam share their own spiritual struggles and how they're working them through? Um, why wouldn't parents do the same thing? I think that may occur, but not very often. So I think helping people, help integrating spiritual struggles as part of religious education and family life, I think, would really be a, a uh, would help people grow uh, spiritually, rather than once they have questions, leave because there's no place to take them and they feel guilt and shame for having questions. By the way, I should I should add that it also applies to ministers and chaplains. I've seen a number of chaplains and ministers over the years who are struggling themselves and feel they have no place to go with them themselves. They don't feel uh, a, a lot of safety in their own context for talking about them. So uh, that's another area for growth. Thank you for the response. And I will read this last one from Michael Washington. Thank you for your presentation. Two related questions. In a truly spiritual, spiritually integrated approach to care, does one need to be concerned with convincing skeptics or simply doing the integrative work. That's one. For chaplains in particular, in your view, how does one negotiate with scholarly need for data and the practical need for care? I think they go hand in hand. Uh, I think it's important to create a nest or context of support to be able to do the work that you do. And so to be able to persuade hospital administrators, people in the healthcare field of the, in, in the value of the work that you're doing, um, how do you do that? Well, I mean, you can talk about it in human terms and that's a very important part of the persuasive, persuasive process, but having empirical data, I think um, is important. You know, we're in an evidence-based care world now and to be able to show, as we can, the value of uh, chaplaincy services in addressing spiritual struggles and helping people tap into their spiritual resources and respond to their spiritual needs, to be able to document the impact that that has in health and well-being and patient satisfaction, I think helps to, again, create the underlying support for, for the, the, whole, the whole field. Thank you, Michael, for your question and Dr. Pargament for, for your response, but also for this entire one hour with you. And 
listening and sharing with you and reflecting with you. And thank you everyone for attending our first of three presentations on the series, series on religious spiritual struggles. Um, I put a post in here about requesting the video recording. If you choose to, you can email me and we'll be happy to share that resource with you. Thank you everyone for sharing and, and being with us today. Bye-bye. And if we email you for it, can we share it with our teams? Yes, you can share it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Ken, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, Edward. All right. Bye-bye.